All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. And today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Mark Stevens, who I'm a very huge fan of. And I've been listening and implementing his work for years now. And uh, I guess you go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, Mr. Stevens. Oh, it's just Mark, Mark Stevens. Uh, uh, Mark, <laughs> the website, markstevens.net. And I wrote a little book a few years ago called Adventures in Legal Land. Yeah, and um, pretty much what that book went into was the whole fiction that is the legal system and how we are told to look up and hold this as the as the pinnacle of society when in reality it's actually just a system that's put there to take advantage of us and take most of our money but one thing one problem that I run into when trying to share the information that you put out on your show is a lot of people have a hard time like defending themselves in court and I have a lot of friends that I try to share this knowledge with and try to get them to at least put in a file a few motions, just go into the court and ask a couple of questions. But most people are scared to do that. And what do you think contributes to that? Well, because the, everything is done on a threat, duress, and coercion. It, they're not being asked to go to court. They're being ordered to go to court. So the you know, because there is, it, there's always that, you know, the gun, the ever-present gun, uh, if they don't show up to court, they know that they can go to jail for contempt. You know, a warrant for their arrest will be issued, which authorizes a police officer to use deadly force, if necessary, to bring them into that building. And so, you know, this this um, uh, you know what I've told someone just the other day. They were trying to say I was being dramatic. And I was exaggerating and uh, when I mentioned about force. I said, you have what's called a force continuum. Don't tell me it doesn't involve, you know, it doesn't involve force. I think, yeah. uh, if you take the force continuum out, then we're on equal footing. That's not, that's not such a bad place to start, but you don't. And that's why uh, people are so afraid because they know that it's all supported by violence. If I don't do this, they will punish me severely. But it seems that they also have a lot of cognitive dissonance because a lot of people, even though they are scared of the system and they do recognize the violence and the force, they also tend to think the system is justified in being there. They, even though they've all seen thousands of examples of you know, police brutality and justice, they still believe that that system is the best hope for justice or is the only thing that's holding society together. So even though they're threatened to participate in the system, a lot of them feel like they have to participate and it's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I think they, they look at it that there's no peaceful remedy available. You know, it, 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 it may be, and a lot of it has to do with this jingoistic garbage that, you know, I think you were, you know, alluding to, that my country right or wrong. You know, hey, you know, if you don't like it, move to Somalia. I don't care how bad it is in this here United States. Go move to Somalia. Move in with the Al-Qaeda. You, you, you know, it, it, there's a lot of social pressure. That yeah. are, are bearing down is bearing down on, most, on on so many people. So even though you can give them the tools to get a traffic ticket kicked out, uh, the the overriding social pressure and fear to you know, the, the, that my gosh, you're not going to go just go in and plead guilty. You're not going to just pay the fine. Oh, 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 what do you think? You're better than us. Yeah. <laughs> They've even said that to me. Well, you think you're better? You think you could do whatever you want? No, I, I in fact, uh, quite the opposite. I, I believe uh, of living, I went through this just today. <laughs> I believe by living my life by a simple principle, uh, do no harm. Yeah. And, it's, and it's funny you say that because that's why I'm so, a lot of us are so scared of doing a jury, a jury trial because even though, you know, the, the, the information and the evidence we present is correct, the fact is most of the people in the jury would, would would side with the court just because they don't want you know they don't want to see you get out of what they had to pay you know what i mean it's kind of like uh you can't you know that's why a lot of times we we just go with a bench trial as opposed to a jury trial because the jury is kind of un unreliable in that way because most of them have been brainwashed to support the courts anyway so when they see you get a ticket and you're able to you know or get some kind of offense and you're able to beat it or you know challenge it in court they they will still side with the court just because you know what i mean like it, oh, they yeah. will feel some type of way about how they couldn't get away with it and that's kind of the scariest thing 
Well, the ju- you got to you know look at the psychology, which I go through in depth in in Government Indicted, which will be out real soon. But you know, I'm talking days. Uh, if you re- look at the the whole tribal aspect or the the um, the group thing, the social pressure that goes into it. If you re- look, you're not you as a defendant are not the only one that is forced to be there that day. The jury is forced; they are there on the threat, duress, and coercion, same as you are. And they're going to look, and and they split people up. They're on a different side. They're on the government side. You're not. I think. I think more uh, some of these other issues. You know, it, I, I think you're right, especially when you look at a tax evasion, where they're like, well, well, I'm. You know, he's not paying his fair share. I don't give a. I don't care about the evidence. He didn't. I, I have to pay. You got to pay. And yeah. the way they look at it, you know, you um, you know, you've, you have all these things that are at play. But the the one of the things that if you just play it straight though, and you you when you're doing it with, I, I still think you're better off with a jury because you, you 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 have somebody who may be conditioned, but he's not conditioned and such a state man as the judge is because the judge, if you leave it to the judge, you're leaving it to a former prosecutor because most of these guys are former prosecutors. I'm not saying all of them, but most judges are former prosecutors, so they're state guys. Mm-hmm. Just like in a tax court, they all come from district council or they're, they're treasury attorneys. They, these are the people who have been supporting them. So when you get on the jury, what's really working against you is if you live your life by do no harm, which I think we all should, I think it's the best way to go. And if, 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 if you're someone like me who believes in personal autonomy and responsibility and not blind obedience, you're going to have a serious problem getting a fair and impartial jury because the jury is going to be conditioned, like you mentioned, the jury is conditioned and are only there because of blind obedience. Their view of the world is obey. Do what you are told. Not think for yourself and do what you believe is right consistent with the principle of do no harm. (laughs) So there, you, you could show with just that, the, the, the fact that the jury showed up and their model of the world is obedience, you can show that you can't get a fair and impartial jury because their view of the world is completely 180 degrees in opposition of what your view of the world is. And they're just going to see you as a disobedient child. You didn't listen to daddy. True. That's very true. And, and they didn't want to be there. They were forced to be there. So... You know, the whole thing is kind of a question at that stage. But let's backtrack a bit, though. I want to go back, you know, to what got you started into looking at the whole court system and, you know, doing some background research and getting these cases thrown out. What was, you know, your point of origin as far as this whole topic is is, is you know, concerned? Well, I, I got I, not to spend too much time on it because I did a video called Delusions, which is on uh, – on YouTube, uh, which I recommend. It was about an hour and a half, and I really go into depth of this, but I got screwed in court in Long Island, and it turned out that the the uh, defendant or the plaintiff, well, the guy I was opposed, he actually the, the, he owned the building that the court was located in. And and, and, and that was after, in, you know, because I'm from Long Island, and I had gone to SUNY Stony Brook. I had gone to the law library there. It took me weeks to, you know, I had to learn how to navigate the law library, and and it's the code and the labor laws and whatnot. So I've put all this time, money, and effort into this brief, and then the judge came out and just said, you know, judgment for the other guy. And I, you know, subsequently learned that the building was owned by the, you know, by the other guy. And uh, you know, so when I moved down here to Phoenix, I was already pretty disillusioned. So I stumbled upon the Patriot community. And I'm just a skeptic by nature. I just don't take what people hand to me at face value. I'm, let me, I, I got to know for myself. And I just, this, the more I started researching it, and the more I started attacking, you know, collaterally attacking and, and questioning what was being presented, the more it fell apart. So here I got the public relations from the government people that, that holds no water whatsoever. And then I'm getting this Patriot stuff, and that holds... Uh, um, Pretty much no water either, and and so I, you know, I, I stumbled upon, you know, I started, I, I came across some cases that, that were showing that the government, or the state, had no duty to protect you, 
And that's where it all, compl- you know, it collapsed for me. And into where, you know, it was, uh, they're just a gang of killers, thieves, and liars. There's no duty to protect you. If there's no duty to protect you, and the only thing that makes you a citizen is a duty of protection in return for duty of allegiance, well, I don't know them having any allegiance. And that's the only thing that ties you to their law. Oh, this is allegiance and protection. So the whole thing collapsed because there were no citizens because there's no duty to protect. And then I stumbled upon, by chance, Lysander Spooner's No Trees in the Constitution of Authority, and that pretty much sealed the deal. I mean, from that, I was pretty firm in my belief that, uh, they, you know, their government is just a gang of killers, thieves, and liars. And, and you can prove that by just, well, taxation. It's all compulsory. So that that's really where what got me, you know, to the to the, the, the anarchist or the voluntarist uh, mindset of not having a ruler and seeing that government is just a fiction. So when did you actually start going into court and fighting cases? And uh, how did you get a lot of that? Info? Did you just start doing it and over time you, you know, found better ways of working around the courts? Or is it that, uh, or is it that I don't know, it's just like you found this information somewhere and you started using it also? Like well, I found... Started go- I- well, I found some information, of course, but I started hey, going into court and just questioning. I, I was just fascinated by, by, I hate to say it, but you know, lawyers who were very good at cross-examination. I don't mean the ones that were yelling and screaming like Kunstler and, uh, or the one who defended Gotti. I mean the guys who just methodically pulled the witnesses' statements apart. So I was just questioning things, and I was taking what I was learning into court. You know, I had I it, it was a case of a little you know too little knowledge and too much nerve <laughs> which some of us have <laughs> and, it, and so when I went into court I knew at a deep level I was right it was just a matter of learning how to get that across in a, in a very effective non-combative way and I just learned from experience well there are certain things that get a rise out of them, then there's certain things, you know, where I get certain admissions. Like when I would purposely, I, I learned that if I purposely asked the police officer questions that required him to give a legal conclusion, that I broke the law or that the law applied to me, things like this, I noticed a pattern that the judge or the prosecutor or both would always object and say that they were incompetent to testify. So I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm in, you know, basically impeaching every witness they're bringing against me. And I noticed a pat, you know, so you learn from that, you know, like I had used a legal, in, uh, a, a legal defense or a legal argument as opposed to just facts. And I had a judge, Brian Strong, you know, he's still a lawyer out here in, in, in Phoenix. Anybody can look him up, Brian Strong, he's a lawyer in, uh, out of a company in Mace, Arizona. And he's, and so I read from Brown versus Texas that it was illegal to arrest someone just to ascertain their identity, which is, which is what happened to me. And he sneered down at me. That's your interpretation. So, you know, I learned that if you bring issues of law, you're going to lose almost every time, if not every single time, depending on where you are. So, it's, you know, when, when you're going into these situations, you've you got to learn something. So even if you win or you get the ticket thrown out, rather, you should have learned something. If, you get the, if the ticket doesn't, if they dig their heels and learn from it. And so that's what I did. And I learned that if I take a legal position, they're going to say no. So I had to get around that. So I started focusing on the facts, the evidence the prosecutor is supposed to have, because I knew the prosecutor didn't have it. And I knew at, at the very least, if I go in and assume that the prosecutor doesn't have evidence for X, Y, Z, I should at least still be questioning it, and at least that will come out so that I can challenge that, and then I can deal with the with, you know, with the, uh, the relevance and the reliability of the evidence and the witness that's presenting it. It was, it was an adaptive process, and it still is. Oh, that's that's interesting. So, so for someone that's uh, that's had no experience with this and that has a traffic ticket, like, what is the breakdown of of, your, of what you do in the courtroom, or what you recommend that they do in the courtroom, and how would you put it to them in the simplest way possible? Take what they are presenting to you, and apply critical thought and analysis to it. Don't read into necessarily what they're doing, like a lot of patriot type of Freeman on land type, which I'm not a, a part of that, and I don't, I don't see eye to eye with most of what they're teaching. And just ask who, what, where, why, when, and how. 
you know, you're applying logic. It's called the, you know, like the trivium, which is who, what, where, when. And then the logic part is why. And then explain how. And if you do that with just what they're presenting to you, it, it, it'll collapse. And don't accept the sacred cows. Don't accept for a second that what the prosecutor or the police officer is presenting to you is accurate just because they're cops. So at best, all you're doing is verifying. You're verifying something that may or may not be true. If it's true, great. Then see how that fits into the picture and if it's actually something that they can use against you. Because if you, if you take a position or you try to, if you, if you try to impose your prejudgments on it, chances are you're going to not only pick up a burden of proof that doesn't belong to you, uh, you're going to make things more difficult and it's going to discredit you. Yeah, and that makes sense. And uh, one thing we found here is when, when going into court, you know, just simply asking a few questions or even, you know, going into the whole process that you recommend, it's like the courts almost try to avoid you. And that's the one thing that I try to share with a lot of, a lot of people I know is, you know, by watching TV shows and movies, they make it seem as if it's a highly complicated process to go to court and stand up for yourself. You know, I have friends always tell me like, oh, you're going to be your own lawyer as if that's something special. Like I have to do hours of work just to hand in one sheet of paper and ask a couple of questions in the courtroom, you know. And one thing that I've noticed also, which you did mention, was the free man on the land type movements which require people to do hours and hours and hours of research and they require you to know every little piece of the law or of the game and what do you think is wrong with that approach and how does yours differ mine differs because we're taking critical thought and analysis and we're applying it to the allegations of a police officer or a prosecutor just some lawyer or we're applying it to a let's say a tax agent's allegations. Now, I know that a tax agent may disagree with me, and they do disagree with me when I say it's an allegation or an accusation, but when someone says you're a taxpayer, I see that as really no different in process as calling someone a rapist or a murderer. You're accusing them of, you're, it's an accusation. And so I differ in that I start from the facts, and I start from what I personally can verify, and there's no, there's no real legal theory behind what I do in that sense. And what they're doing is taking issues of law or interpretations of law. They're not starting from the evidence. So what, what I usually sign off on my show, the No State Project, is that government is just a group of men and women providing services at the barrel of a gun. If they were interested in protecting your life, liberty, and property, they wouldn't be the first ones threatening to take it. And that's a statement that could be independently verified and has been independently verified by thousands of people. Anybody can verify that. And so nobody has to take my word on what I present. Anybody can verify for themselves that these people, because there is no government, that they're just people, that they have no voluntary support. Just ask them, they'll tell you. Uh, Take the tax tag off of, you know, called the license plate. Take it off your car. See what happens. So it, it, they're, they're two diametrically opposed uh, methods, if you will, or models. Mine starts from the verifiable evidence and stays on the verifiable evidence because we're just comparing it to the accusations that are being made. And the Freeman on the Land Patriot type of stuff is always it, it, they always seem to start from a legal position or a legal interpretation based on someone's reading of the law, which is not something I get into. I don't care what the law says until it's proven it applies. So I don't get into that. And so what you're what the, what you're getting at is I'm comparing the objective truth, the facts, the evidence to the subjective, the opinions. So it's always objective versus the subjective, which. We know what's going to win out, at least logically and rationally. When, when you do the Freeman type of stuff, you're going with opinion versus opinion instead of fact versus opinion. And when you're going opinion or subjective versus the, versus the subjective, the opinion versus the opinion or the, the fiction versus the fiction, uh, the men with the guns tend to, uh, well, they don't care. They're psychopaths, and they don't care. 
because there's going to be conflicting opinions that they can show that their their guy in the court agree with them. Well, he agrees with my opinion, so I must be right. So your opinion may be right, but it's not an effective way to go about convincing someone that they're doing the wrong thing. It's very difficult to get someone to change their opinion with another opinion. At least you have a fighting chance to change someone's opinion when you have you know facts that conflict with that opinion. Yeah, that's that's very true indeed. Uh yeah, and they, and again I'd like to thank you for coming on this show and sharing some of your time. And what current projects are you currently working on and where can my listeners find you and find some of your work? Well, the radio show is every every Saturday. So we've got a lot of stuff going on there. We have, you know, so the show is an ongoing is an, the show is basically uh, the weekend wrap up uh of what we've done during the week with people. Uh, and you know, the people who call the show uh usually have parking tickets, traffic tickets, drug possession type things, or tax. So we spend a lot of time on the show helping that way. I have a parking ticket study that, that we do. And someone just had, I don't have the documentation yet, but we'll post it. Anyone who goes to markstevens.net can see on the success stories that we do post the evidence quite often. Uh, someone just got here. Uh, the parking ticket study is done so that people who want to go to court and challenge these fictions that there's a state, that there's a government, that there are cities and you know, things like that, or that the law applies to anybody because there's no evidence the Constitution laws apply to anybody. So those people who want to get active and, and take some baby steps, we have the parking ticket study where if you have the opportunity to go to court, because it really helps to be able to do that, otherwise they just run over you and you don't get to really make the challenge, you can get the ticket and there's no violent confrontation with the police officer. You just leave the car parked somewhere, you get the ticket, and, and as long as you um, do things the way I would do it, you're basically like a proxy for me, and then I help with the paperwork, and we coach you through, we get you prep of court, and you can make those challenges. So, the, so even if it gets derailed where they're just a you know, monstrous psychopaths and they don't care about right or wrong, you could just throw 50 bucks at them and walk away, and, you know, so, again, it's very little risk that's involved. So that's one of the projects. Um, we're also engaged in filing complaints against lawyers, whether they're prosecutors or judges, uh, with the Bar Association and then taking it higher. And we, we spoke extensively last weekend about bringing these issues to the companies that hold the insurance policies for these municipalities. So if we can possibly get an internal investigation by the insurance company, we may actually for the first time ever that I know of get a sitting judge under oath to discuss the evidence that the prosecutor prosecutors are giving them to prove that they have jurisdiction over us. So we're really that because we believe but the evidence is there that it's easier to, to prove that a judge and prosecutor are corrupt to someone who's outside the government than it is to prove that a judge and prosecutor are corrupt to somebody who's in that same government, who's a part of that same gang of killers, thieves, and liars. So <laughs> that's something I believe uh, is very promising, that we'll be able to have some leverage on them. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and it's really, and again, it's another low-risk thing that people can do um, where they can make these challenges Without yeah, having to actually get attacked. That's yeah. A, I, oh. I said that's a pretty easy way to challenge the system without actually, you know, because most of us who've gone to court, we've, we're fa you know, we've faced, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of tickets. And to actually go in with a, with, a, with a little parking ticket, you know, you could be more comfortable expressing yourself in court because, you know, at the end of the day, it's just 50 bucks, you know, or, so, or whatever they're charging for that ticket. That's a very well, sure. good idea. You know, you know not everyone's going to get on the radio. And tell people not to comply with the tax code. I mean, I tell people that as often as I can. Don't comply with the tax code. If you want a free autonomous uh, society, one that's not based on warfare like we have now, uh, you have to. It, it's going to include not complying with the tax codes. That's just it's you know that's the way it is. So not violent, non-violent, non-cooperation. It's the quickest solution, big, really. But well, you know, if, it, every, if everybody would do, would just not comply with the tax code, that would be one of the quickest solutions. Yes. Yeah, right. And, it, you know, but this way people can get active and engage and, they're, you know, it's not like they have to have all this social pressure from 
friends and family because like it's fifty bucks. It's fifty. Sometimes it's not even fifty bucks. I mean, I I had two tossed down here recently, and each time my wife's like, "It's twenty eight bucks. Just pay it." No, no, make it a point here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and we're making a point here. So, in fact, at least some, they don't have to. They don't have to worry about going to jail. That's that's very important. Well, <laughs> you do have. I, I do want to point out that anytime you do go to court, though, you are running the risk of going to jail for contempt. But it's very, very slim. I think with a parking ticket, if things like, again, if things, if, if things get start getting derailed real fast, you you could just bail and all right, uh, uh, yeah, I'm done. Fifty bucks. Let's yeah. go. Where do I pay? And you walk away yeah. from the psychopath, but you can still file a complaint against them. Yeah, that's true. I paid it on the threat to arrest and coercion. This person started screaming, and if that's the type of person that uh, you know we you know you ha- you have up there, we have some problems. <laughs> but I believe that when you file a complaint, that it needs to be pointed out that they exhibited psychopathic behavior. You you the the the, the, oh. the fact that they flew into a rage so fast. Speak, speaking on psychopathic behavior, we have this judge down here in in, uh, in Colleen, Texas. This is uh, he's like a wannabe comedian judge, who not only you know, not only does he you know prey on these people who know nothing about the legal system, he actually goes out of his way to try to be funny and entertaining and make fun of them. You know that that whole, you know, Judge Joe Brown or whatever TV judge act. Like times ten because this guy is actually a real judge and he's actually you know screwing people's lives over and we we see a lot of that all over here and that's I could understand why a lot of people you know have their fear of going to court and sometimes just want to hand in their money because there's no telling what you get once you go into you know a situation with one of these guys. Judges are so dangerous. I want to put this in context, and anybody can verify this for themselves. This is very easy. People think that Congress has a tremendous amount of power in the president, and they do. I'm not, not, they, they can launch a war. When it comes to you as an individual man or woman here in, the, in this part of North America, judges trump them all. They're not going to launch a war on Mace, Arizona anytime soon. I just don't, I, I don't see it. But the, the, I, now, Congress has never been able to pass a law. I don't even know if they've tried that made it a crime, a felony, to call them by their first name. Now, if you walk into court and you call a judge by their first name, there's a pretty good chance not only are they going to rage to a point where people are going to be afraid that they're going to have a stroke, they will rage so hard, they will put you, they will not only threaten you with contempt, some of them may actually put you in jail for contempt. Now, think of, so, it's it, 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 yeah, you can go to – look, I have been at, the, at the, uh, the receiving end of that rage. I wasn't actually put in jail, but I have been threatened for calling judges by their first name. It enrages them. Hmm. And so here, you, it's a jailable offense to call a judge by his first name. But Congress has never even attempted or any state legislature has even, even attempted. Let's pass a law making it a crime to call us by their first by our first name. They'd be laughed at. So, it, it, but judges get away with it. Judges are able to do that. Judges can actually put you in prison for the or jail for the rest of your life just because they said so. No jury, mm. no trial, nothing. Spend the rest of your natural life in jail. So you always have to whenever you go to court, even if it's with a parking ticket. You need to prepare because you're going into the lion's den because you're dealing with the psychopaths. Uh, we'll soften it a little bit. Corporate psychopath. These people are very dangerous. So I'm glad people take the baby step and want to go and participate. And we've had success in U.S., Canada, Australia, and England with the parking ticket study. Uh, so I'm very happy to show that we were able to replicate the, the results no matter where we happen to be. You definitely want to exercise caution. You want to dress in a suit, and you want to be professional. Never raise your voice, uh, be, and just remember you're dealing with a psychopath. And uh, that's, uh, that's they can find that on markstevens.net. You said your book is coming out in a couple of days. The new book that you're writing. Well, it's it's going to definitely be you know in you know I I should have it at the printer, and I'll take pre-orders in a few days. Yeah. Government indicted. Yeah. Government indicted. And what's what's the whole uh what's the premise of the book? What is, how does it differ from your previous book, Adventures in Legal Land? 
It's actually an indictment. In, in a, unlike a political indictment, I'm showing causation. I'm showing where the problem is not any one particular individual. It's the concept of government itself and the hierarchy that comes with it. That causes a radical change in behavior. And so I go through and I show how the concept itself, one, is nonsensical. Okay, it's, it's, it's contradictory. The idea, and, and in a nutshell, the idea that the rules of morality that we all accept to not attack other people, okay, uh, do no harm, but that the morality that applies to the individual, man, woman, or child, does not apply to people called government. As long as they're called government, the rules don't apply to them. And so I show this, the, the uh, tremendous psychological damage that this causes. And I do show causation. So this is not just me saying, oh, this is going to get... No. We've, I've, oh, the evidence is there. It's all throughout the book. It's a large part of the book. So I show the psychological damage that's caused by the concept itself. And then I also show the tremendous economic damage that it's caused. And then the second half of the book is actually a, uh, a model an explicit model with examples of how to uh, limit the amount of damage that the psychopaths, these predators, want to do to you, whether it's a parking ticket, a speeding ticket, a possession charge, or a tax charge. Uh, it, it, this is a walkthrough model. And the reason why the book is so large is because there are so many real-life examples that I give as support for why I'm, it's just like adventures in that sense. It's just that I have yeah. ten more. I have ten more years experience going into this book. So there are a lot of more real life examples, and and a lot of the examples where I give like Norman Smith, who's a prosecutor in in Oklahoma, federal prosecutor. I put his contact information in. I use all real names for the office that's intended. Uh, okay, so he's a federal prosecutor in Oklahoma, Norman Smith, and I give his contact information. So if anybody reads the book and says, Mark is full of crap, Norman didn't say that, call him. <laughs> call the man, and maybe, maybe he'd be a little bit more open, but he was the one that was insisting he could prove that the, even though he had no evidence the code applied, he believed he could prove that the code applies by proving it was violated. And so how do you do that? And you couldn't tell me. You know, it, 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 this is, it comes back to when you asked me before what, what I do or how it differs. You're injecting simple logic into the equation. And when you do that, you're, you've got a, a certain linear progression that you're going through. You, to pr before you can prove that I violated the U.S. code, you have to prove the U.S. code applies to me. True. That's just logic. I mean, it, it, the code has to apply for you to say to me, well, I'm going to prove you violated it by proving you violated. I'm going to prove the code applies by proving you violated it. No, no, that's putting the cart before the horse. That's a logical fallacy. That's not how rational people think. And that's why we also get into these the circular logic that they do. Uh, well, the code applies because the code said so. Well, that's circular. You're beginning, you know, and you have to explain to them, well, it's not circular, Mark. You're being circular. No, 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 no. Let me, when you start and end with the same premise, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that's circular. You know, so if I ask what evidence do you have that the code applies to me, or the Constitution, the code applies to me, and you say, well, the, the code says, <laughs> no, the, yeah, we know what the code says, but what evidence do you have that it applies? Because they believe that the law applies to you whether you're, you know, when you're just standing there in, in Texas. And I've asked them. They've told me. So if I'm just standing here in Texas, just standing here, you tell me the Constitution laws apply and you have jurisdiction over me. That's right. So it doesn't matter what any one particular section says. Yeah, they, they don't like when you inject logic, which is why they start throwing out all sorts of ridiculous logical fallacies at you. And, and one is they, they like to kill the messenger. Well, Mark, you're an idiot. Well, that be that as it may. Yeah. What evidence do you have? That prosecutors do that. They do it all the time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And uh, well, folks, this has been a great interview with Mark Stevens from MarkStevens.net. I don't want to take up all your time. I know you have to get going pretty soon. Uh, this has been one very enlightening call, and I hope we could do it again sometime in the near future. And I appreciate it. Thanks very much.